So tonight being uh, November 6th, 2021, it's Long Liam's 80th birthday. And so I thought I uh, would start with myself. I'll read uh, from this gratitude book. Uh, it's a uh, Lung Pali I'm teaching and then would invite uh, after this short reading would we'll invite uh Lung Pasano and then and then Ajahn Amaro to give some reflections, uh, thoughts, possibly stories about Lung Pali M over over the decades. Um, and this uh this gratitude book is quite special because it was not a talk, but it was actually something he wrote while he was here at Abayagiri in 2009, and it's translated by Ajahn Siri Panyo. And I was just looking through it. It's, it's quite wonderful. And uh, you get a, when Lung Pao Liam writes something, he's got very beautiful handwriting as well, and when Lung Pao Liam writes something, it's, uh, it's incredibly heartfelt and full of meaning. <clears throat> Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambutasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambutasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambutasa Budang damang sanghang namasami Oh God, cup. So this uh, this talk is, or this paper that uh, Lung Pao Liam wrote, it's called The Right Angle, It's Never Wrong, offered to a Bayagiri Buddhist monastery in May 2009, translated by Ajahn Sri Panyo. The entire world and everyone in it needs the Dhamma as protection. We all survive and find comfort in life with the support of the knowledge and skills, mindfulness and wisdom of countless others. Without their help, we would all perish as soon as we leave our mother's womb. We'd have no food to eat, clothes to wear, or a house to live in. Our parents, whose faces we have never even seen before, Give us life and all the things we need to make us healthy and strong. For our clothes and living places and all the various skills we learn, we are entirely indebted to others. From the first moments in our mother's womb, all of us have a debt of gratitude owed to innumerable other people. No need to mention our parents and all our teachers to whom the sense of gratitude we should feel is incalculable. Even people of one nation have much to be grateful for to those living in another. This is something which, if you think about it, is not too hard to see. Knowing and acknowledging with gratitude the debt we have to others and placing them above ourselves is called katanyuta. The effort to repay the debt is called katawedita. The ones who know what has been done for them are called katanyu. And those who return the favor gratefully are called katawedi. Katanyu katawedi datta, uh, katanyu katawedi ta. Acknowledging the debt we owe to others and paying it back with acts of gratitude are spiritual qualities which protect the world from harm, help society to function, and lead to peace and happiness. People, however, are less and less able to see what we all have this that we all have this mutual debt of gratitude, which must be repaid. And failing to understand this is the reason for the increase in heated fighting and quarreling. So, taking an interest in the qualities of Katanyu Katawedi is something which is of vital importance to us all. All the beautiful customs and traditions of old have in part been grounded in the principles of Katanyu Katawedi. These qualities were firmly established nurtured over time and deeply understood by all societies. Anyone who fails to accept that our lives are inextricably linked with one another and who does not see our mutual indebtedness will surely live a life of selfish ingratitude. The people who manifest most gratitude are the ones who acknowledge that even cows and buffaloes and other animals have helped us along the way. All the more so our parents and our teachers. 
If more people could develop gratitude to the cows and buffaloes of our world, then society would always be happy and peaceful on account of such a broad vision and lofty thoughts. Feeling grateful, even to the animals, how could we harm our fellow human beings to whom we owe so much more? Any society prospers and flourishes when its members cultivate spiritual qualities. Having fully developed the human potential, the capacity for, for profound thoughts, people will be diligent and skilled in earning their livelihood without intending even the slightest harm to one another. If we wish to so prosper again, it goes without saying how much we have to be grateful for to our parents and teachers, since these are the true devas illuminating our lives, the pujaniya pukala, the people worthy to be held up high above our own little heads and truly venerated. Anyone who develops a more refined sense of gratitude in life will gradually feel a deep appreciation to the forests, fields, streams, rivers, and swamps, the paths and roads and everything in the world, the flowers and the unknown birds flying here and there all around us. Not knowing the value of forests, there are those who have destroyed them with their selfishness, so our children and grandchildren will have no wood for their houses. In addition, the streams and marshes dry up because the forests, where the water reserves naturally gather, have all gone. Without the forests and the flowing streams, the clouds can no longer form and build up to release their abundant rains. Fruit trees are cut down whole, so their entire worth is reduced to what can be harvested that one time. If people simply had gratitude in their hearts, then these things couldn't happen. The things which gladden the mind would be plentiful all over the earth and everywhere we would live at ease. Being grateful for all the things our planet provides us with, we would cherish, nurture, and foster its welfare. On a deeper and more subtle level, still, we can also acknowledge even the debt we owe to our enemies and feel grateful for life's obstacles. Viewed from this angle, such opponents help us to grow in wisdom, patient endurance, and a spirit of sacrifice. People who are envious and jealous only serve to strengthen our own hearts and bring out the best of our metta and karuna, which we might ordinarily lack. All the difficulties we face allow us to see the world in its true nature, and through learning how to overcome life's challenges, we find the way to a life of ease. All our illnesses and problems can thus give rise to insight in us. We are forced to let go until we really see the truth of anicca, dukkha, and anatta, and eventually realize the path and fruit of nibbana. People without katanyu do not know the value of these adversities, and they heap disaster and peril onto their lives while digging their own graves with anger and negativity. Their minds know no ease, and their lack of self-control, with the frustration it brings, means that they are filled with fear and trembling, as life seems to go ever more wrong. They are on a fixed course for self-destruction. However, those who appreciate life's challenges, who gratefully rise up to meet them, bring an immeasurable coolness and beauty to the world. The most demonic of people, the world's maras, they venerate as if they were virtuous monks. The yaka types, those who are insatiably greedy or angry, they view as truly worthy human beings. They see the generous side of stingy people and, even in others' jealousy, they manage to find a degree of warmth. If all people felt this way, how could our world fail to become a heavenly realm? We should all be grateful to our enemies, for they are the ones who give us life's highest teachings, lessons which are to be found nowhere else. We should therefore give thanks to them and honor such teachers with our own efforts to embody goodness, sharing the blessings of our life with them. There is so much to be grateful to our enemies for. People with Katanyu are very aware of this. With no enemies or obstacles in life, the world would be empty of truly capable people. Knowing the value of adversity, nothing in life is perceived as bothersome or difficult. With lofty thoughts such as these, as people develop this most subtle sense of gratitude, this very capacity to appreciate those who oppose us and those things which obstruct us, the heat from the frictions of the world becomes cool. Considering this, 
how even our enemies have been so much help to us. Try then to imagine the value of our mothers and fathers and the highest of all objects of veneration, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. Not a single one of us was conceived in a hollow tree stump. We all arose in the little space of our mother's womb, with the help of our father too. Having been born into the wide world, we survived through to maturity thanks to the daily sacrifices of our parents and all the countless others who played a role in our lives. The Buddha and all wise people point to the role of our parents, honoring them as our primary caregivers who, having brought us forth, provided us with all the support we needed to flourish. They are the ones who equipped us with the skills for living, taught us how to be good, and gave us many other things that have brought blessings into our lives. Anyone who lacks integrity, who is incapable of feeling appreciation for his or her parents, will surely never know the debt they owe their enemies. Deeply absorbing one's parents' qualities is a clear sign of katanyu, wherever in the world a person is from, and one who lacks gratitude in his or her parents will never fully be trusted. Spiritual teachers undertake the task of training their disciples' minds, picking up from where their parents left off, and taking them to yet even higher levels. For this purpose, teachers have to develop extraordinary patient endurance and painstakingly put their hearts into their work if they are to plant and cultivate deeper and deeper levels of spiritual awareness in their disciples' minds. This is the sign of true metta in a teacher. They must constantly study and train themselves to a very high level, thereby having the wherewithal to instill the truth in their disciples' hearts. This is the sign of true wisdom in a teacher. Teachers must be constantly selfless and, in this way, remain the reliable objects of their disciples' deep veneration, not just spiritual workers to be hired and fired. Any disciples, having cultivated a wholesome mind and knowing what is proper, will feel much katanyu toward their teachers, those who bring coolness to the world with their enduring patience and wisdom. Acknowledging the debt we have to our parents and teachers simply makes one want to give in return. This is achieved by doing only that which will be of benefit to future generations. Disciples will do anything to honor the good name of their spiritual home, and they constantly share the merits of their wholesome actions with their mother, father, and teachers. The Lord Buddha once said that when we reflect correctly on the qualities of someone who has died, then only one path lies open to us, that of developing goodness in ourselves. In the broadest sense, this means to honor that person and share the blessings of our life with them. So anyone who loves their mother, father, or spiritual guide, and who knows the debt owed to them, should turn their hearts and minds to that which is beneficial for the world. The Blessed One, the Buddha, is known as the supreme teacher for the ability he had to deepen people's awareness to a point where they no longer experienced any suffering at all, to a state of nobility, a realization of enlightenment. The Dhamma taught by him is a pathway to improve the mind and go beyond the oceans of suffering. The Sangha, men and women whose lives are dedicated to following his teachings, have handed down these truths over the years until they have reached us here today. This chance we have to receive these highest gifts is as wonderful as if the Blessed One himself were offering them directly to us. The noble disciples endured all manner of hardships in order to faithfully maintain the Buddha's dispensation, all of this having been done with the heart of deep devotion and gratitude to the teacher. We can be encouraged, then, that the teachings are nothing other than our true rightful inheritance, passed down through the katanyu of the noble ones of former times, who were determined to live their lives in line with the Blessed One's intentions. This katanyu of the enlightened disciples has allowed the Dhamma to span the millennia and, still to this day, the world can find respite in the cool refuge and under the shade of these teachings of awakening. All this is because of the constant hardships endured and the sacrifices made based on the spirit of katanyu flowing strong in the hearts of the liberated ones. 
The world is protected by the Dhamma because from the time of the Buddha onwards, members of the assembly of his disciples have not wandered away from his instructions, their lives always following his guidelines. Thus they have honored and kept alive his spiritual qualities. Gratitude is what protects the world and, in turn, is something that we should all protect. In truth, all good Buddhist traditions and customs have arisen based on the principle of Katanyu Katawedi. They were born out of gratitude and were designed to further instill this sense deeply into the hearts of the next generation. All our various rites and rituals, starting with the cremation of our parents and teachers, should be grounded in a spirit of Katanyu Katawedi. This needs to be firmly established in everyone's mind more than any other thought. So we carry out these ceremonies with true dedication, with no sense there, there might be too much fuss and bother or that the expenses are in any way wasted. Because we see how important it is for our lives to be suffused with a feeling of Katanyu Katawedi and how in turn this makes the world a cool and pleasant place. The traditions and religions of every nation, of every tongue, have all have these principles at heart, and in our Buddhist teachings we must take great care that, however we repay our debt of gratitude, our efforts are not wasted, but are genuinely beneficial for society. In this way, the feelings of gratitude, which should be felt by all Buddhists, bring cool shade to the world and lift up people's hearts. If all of us could realize this highest truth, the fact that each of us human beings has a debt of gratitude to everyone without exception, even, again, those who perceive each other as mutual enemies, then people would vie with one another to carry out acts of goodness and virtue in order to fully pay off the debts we owe. If the hearts of everyone on earth were truly filled with Katanyu Katawedi, then doubtless our world would be more beautiful and alluring than a heavenly realm safer and more praiseworthy than a heavenly realm, more desirable than any heavenly realm. If we consider this well, we will be able to maintain restraint toward one another, not acting impulsively or out of anger. When we think of people who have helped us in the past, parents, siblings, aunts and uncles, then we won't act in mean or selfish ways. And even if we do at times, unthinkingly, we will be quick to ask for and give forgiveness. Thinking of parents and teachers who have passed away brings up thoughts of respect in us, and so we care for and behave compassionately toward our fellow human beings. Katanyu, the spirit of gratitude, has the power to change a yaka into a true human being. The spirit of gratitude will, be, will benefit the world so much and keep it cool forever. Thus we should cherish this highest of qualities, striving and sacrificing to keep it alive in our hearts as the safest shelter for us all. So that's the uh, essay. That's what we can, by, uh, by Long Pa Liam. I'll invite Long Pa to get some reflections. Okay, well, that was a lovely uh, memory coming up because I was here when Lumpa Lee um, uh, was here for that visit and then he, um, I saw him a couple times, um, kind of writing away and, and uh, I didn't quite know what he was doing. But then when, when he was preparing to leave then uh, he yeah, offered this kind of handwritten um, uh, little little essay, little reflection as a gift to to us, uh, and and as he said, out of gratitude for his his stay. So that that's uh, the sense of living with uh, yeah, kind of mutual gratitude, appreciation. Um, of course, I <coughs> have known Lumpa Liam for a long time. First, um, lived with him at Wat Pa Pong, um, 
1973. Um, There's probably quite a few people who weren't even born then. Um, and uh, and he was immediately uh, an inspiring figure, although mm, in in a very interesting contrast to Lumpa Cha. Uh, Lumpa Cha was a very say, ebullient character, um, a very big presence. Um, just by his personality, charisma, and uh, Lumpa Liam was 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 quite different in his he uh, he, he didn't. Um, well, I don't think he actually cared. <laughs> was uh, uh, what uh, what people thought of him, and uh, he just went about. His uh, his duties and his practice and his uh, um, uh, but in doing that he was uh, an, an incredible example uh, for us because he was um, yeah he was very uh, diligent in his practice uh, he was very diligent in helping. Um, the various duties of of uh, looking after the monastery, and and he went about <coughs> everything he did with a a sense of of. For me, he was kind of the epitome of mindfulness and clear comprehension, because uh, he just seemed to be present with with everything that he was doing. And that was uh, so. That was very inspiring to to take as a as an example. Um, so that that his uh, uh, those early years having um, say both Lumpa Cha and Lumpa Liam as a very strong presence at Wapapong. I mean, there were other uh, senior teachers as well, uh, but but certainly uh, those two were the most, um, say, impressive or impactful, uh, certainly for me. And and also when. When Lumpa Liam would give Dhamma reflections, Dhamma talks, of course, because he was um, kind of like a, 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 a assistant abbot, junior, much much junior to Lumpa Cha, then Lumpa Cha did uh, um, most of the teaching, but then. When when Lopa Liam would give teachings, it was always it was always worth listening to. Uh, he was was always very uh, um, articulate and and uh, um, uh, reflective. So that that because uh, it I mean there is a. A kind of a, a a style, say forest forest monastery teachers who kind of rant, uh, or you know, or you know, you know, like try to you know pushing a hard line, and uh, or very forceful, and and Nupal Liam was always reflective, and, and that was very. Uh, interesting and attractive, and 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 he he, I mean, he had a very good knowledge of the of the fundamental principles and teachings uh, of the Buddha, um, sutta based, and and uh, uh, and and his his own pursuit of of learning. 
and but he was also very interested in the mind. So he was always, and one of the things that always sticks. I mean, he used a, a, an idiom from the the uh, 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 from the Pali language, but of course rendered in Thai. Itarom, anitarom, and because pointing to the the moods of the mind that are based in liking or disliking, and that and and usually his his themes of of of, of reflection uh, would would oftentimes circle around that and recognizing how how uh, the mind and and us as human beings keep uh, creating complications, difficulties, suffering because of our because of our preferences, because of our our liking and disliking, because of our believing in the moods of the mind uh, that then generate all the various stories and, and stances and views and opinions. And and he was one who kept trying to get back to the root of, of the, trying to point that to us uh, so that we don't get tangled up in the, in the, uh, just all the you know, conflict and complications uh, of our own mind and of the world around us. And so he was always somebody who was quite uh, even though he was very engaged, he was also very aloof. Uh, it was a nice, it was a really interesting balance. Um, so that his, he was, was uh, yeah, there was that sense of, um, yeah, he, he, he was always there to um, be a part of the, uh, the routine of the monasteries. He was always there to be helping whatever duties and chores and projects that were happening. Uh, he, was, he was always there. Um, but he was also always aloof. Um, he, he wasn't uh, entangled with, um, certainly with the lay community. And then even in the, uh, even in the monastery, it was, was not, uh, um, um, he was one who 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 kept himself maybe focused and centered on practice rather than on on uh, trying to have a whole circle of friends or trying to uh, have have followers or whatever. He was uh, he, he was content in the Dhamma, which was again very inspiring. Um, when he, um, after Ajahn Chah began his decline and became very ill and then became bedridden, um, then the, um, the administration of the monastery um, devolved to um, Lumpa Liam. There were, uh, 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 at the very beginning, there were a couple other monks who were there, um, but, uh, you know, it was, it was a difficult time for everybody. And, uh, um, and, and Lumpa Liam had been uh, kind of pointed out by Ajahn Chah to to uh, uh, to take on um, responsibility, and and he did, and didn't complain. And and uh, um, uh, and of course, I was I be I w that's that was when, at the very beginning when Ajahn Chah started to get sick is when uh, quite ill was when I became the abbot of. Of what Nana Chat, so that's quite close to Wat Bapong, and uh, and 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 I spent a lot of time 
uh, going back and forth, and, and uh, that's that's probably when I got to know Lumpur Liam uh, much better, and uh, and then tried to um, support him because it was it was difficult, and you'd see. Uh, now, of course, he's highly respected and revered, and and uh, um, but uh, in those days, it was like, I mean, uh, Ajahn Chah is a really hard act to follow. So everybody was comparing him to Ajahn Chah, and and uh, that's 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 really difficult. Uh, so that that. Uh, uh, and then the uh, people drifted away, and I, I, I never saw Lumpa Liam express disappointment, discouragement, frustration at uh, at anything. Uh, he just went ahead and did what needed to be done, and. Uh, and then slowly people started to gain yeah confidence and 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 uh, and, res uh, and increased respect uh, from seeing him for what he was he was, he was uh, yeah he wasn't Ajahn Chah. he was he was Lumpalia. and he he uh, and he was a a good teacher and a good leader so that uh, um he is able to um, you know, kind of maintain a stable um, kind of example of leadership at Wat Pa Pong, um, and that that's uh, you know that's really uh, uh, not a small thing, um, uh, and so that was really. Yeah, something really worthy of praise. Um, and he, you know, he was, uh, and he was always doing things, I mean, he was always doing things for the benefit of the monastery, but he was always doing things for the benefit of the, 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 the society around, the lay people around, and he's always, uh, he always had some, uh, doing things as a as an example of showing what what the villagers could could do, um, so that that uh, uh, you know it's quite a uh, in his own way uh, uh, like a a community organizer, community leader, and uh, and and people around uh, the area uh, did uh, really benefit from his. His encouragement and examples, and so over you know, over time, then he he uh, he, he definitely uh, really came into his own and was 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 really yeah, acknowledged, recognized, and, and of course, say his his. Uh, um, and Say today his his uh, his birthday. Uh, it's the the kind of the recognition and acknowledgement and kind of respect that he has. He's 80 uh, today, and and uh, the the they're doing the katina at the same time, uh, which is a say a jula katina, which which is well, that's a very big deal. Um, because you actually start from planting the cotton, growing the cotton, um, harvesting it, um, carding it, spinning it, uh, weaving it into the cloth, a and then sewing it into a into a robe. So it it, it requires the whole community all around the, the monastery, and. And people, um, you know, seeing a few pictures, um, and and yeah, just lots and lots of people 
Um, but but also, it's still pandemic there, but people are you know, quite, quite um, it looks like it was well organized and you know, socially distanced. And, but even a couple of kind of elephants, big Tusker elephants, two, two Tusker elephants leading the procession for Lopal Liam's birthday, and so uh, not a small thing. So they says, yeah, he's he, he's turned into a yeah. a really highly respected, highly revered leader uh, in the sangha, and and he's he's uh, uh, he's done it not by sort of forcing himself on anybody, but just by being a solid presence and example. And and he, uh, when I think of the, at one time, one of the visits that he was here, and he, he's visited several times. I remember one of the times we, uh, when he was visiting, he came and uh, we we went over the city of ten thousand Buddhas to you know, to visit there and and uh, and the abbot of city of ten thousand Buddhas um, uh, uh, Dharma Master Hung Lu um, asked um, uh, Nupaliya uh, what. Uh, what was the most um, difficult thing he'd had to deal with in his practice? And Paul Liam was, was was quiet for 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 quite a while, and he said, "Well, you know, probably the most difficult thing, if it's if I'm going to." point to anything uh, would be would probably dealing with fear so, but that's actually not a really good way to think about it in the sense of you know what uh, in terms of difficulties and, and obstacles he said because it, it then it he said, it's much more useful, rather than thinking of something as a difficulty or as an obstacle, to think of it more as a, as, as a worthy opponent. You know, whatever we're experiencing that, that has some difficulty, as a worthy op op opponent who's come to teach us our shortcomings so that we can learn and develop wisdom. He said, uh, let's say, a, uh, uh, a really uh, important way of viewing things. And so that, that's uh, um, something that, that, that really stuck in, in my mind because, um, yeah, we, it, the tendency, of course, is we have some difficulty or problem and it's me and my problems, and oh, woe is me, and, and uh, well, nobody's ever had to deal with anything as much as this. And, you know, we turn it into a, 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 a story. And Lopaliam is sort of, the, you know, you want to look at it, at it and, and similar to his, his say, his reading, the, the, what, the reading that was just done, was that that sense of uh, uh, gratitude for having something that we, we we can work with and learn from, and so that seeing things as as you know, things that are teaching us. Uh, so that's a uh, uh, you know very important perspective that that you know, Liam really embodies, and because he again the sense of Reflective investigation and, and attentiveness. I mean, he's very, he's very, very alert and attentive, even when, because uh, he has this m kind of manner sometimes of uh, sitting and 
and uh, you know, looking up the corner of the ceiling and what <laughs> while you're talking to him, and as if he's not interested at all. But uh, reality is, is his, his antenna are definitely out, and. Uh, And he, uh, uh, you know, and he tends to, to uh, um, to, uh, um, you know, to just be, be very present, and you, you, nothing much sort of gets past him. The. Maybe the uh, the last thing, and and, and I've mentioned it before in 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 talks, but I think it's it's something that 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 kind of captures Lumpa Liam's essence or his his uh, his strength um, um, is at one point. I guess maybe about ten years ago, he was maybe even a little bit more, where he was going through a, a period of of uh, um, heart problems. His he had um, his health was he was kind of tired and and uh, um, having some difficulties, and he's somebody who is usually very active. And then his uh, um, people finally convinced him to go to a doctor, or had a doctor come and check him out. <coughs> and he was his heart function was kind of pitiful, and, you know, very. You know, it's like it, it was really. Uh, uh, dangerous, uh, and so that that uh, um, the doctors that he would need to have some stints put in to, uh, and he's he's somebody who's you know, he's very very knowledgeable of uh, like traditional medicines, and and he tends to be very uh, independent in looking after himself, and. Um, uh, and using uh, traditional uh, treatments, but mm, say, yeah, but this was not amenable, so he would need to have an operation. And heart operations was a big deal. He'd never really gone to hospital before, I think. And, and uh, so then, uh, and of course, especially the way things work in the northeast of Thailand, uh, everybody gets together. There's big committees for everything, and it's, I mean, in the sense of that's the way the society and whether it's a monastery, the world around, everybody's uh, gives their uh, ways in with their opinions, and 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 Lopali, I mean, this was one particular time where they were having to make a start. Everybody's wanting want to know what his decision is going to be, and he's listening to. Yeah, people and and he's not. You know, I think he's not quite sure yet. Um, yeah, should I go and have an operation? Um, maybe it'll extend my life. Um, um, but you know, do I want to? Do I want to go to that trouble? Um, and then he, he and he was just sort. Of, he gave this this very short kind of observation or, or thought. He says, like, he said, you know, living, dying, it's the same thing. <laughs> and it was like, uh, and for most people, of course, um, it's kind of unthinkable. Um, but for Lumpa Liam, uh, it was not. It was, and it wasn't just sort of some bravado. It was really. Uh, that's how he. 
that's how he saw things. And, um, and, and of course, he did go and uh, have the operation. And he's been a blessing for, for so many people because his, his, his life really would have been cut short, but he, uh, and he's lived to 80 today. So that's, that's, uh, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's been a, a gift to, to all of us. And, and his, yeah, again, his example of it just is, just a real quiet strength, a solid presence of someone who truly lives in the Dhamma. So those are some reflections. Thank you very much for those uh, reflections on on uh, Lumpolium, and um, uh, I probably don't have a lot to add to that. Um, I was also very struck both by the the comments that Lumpolium wrote in that uh, reflection that Ajahn Yaniko uh, read out to us, and also uh, Lumpur Pasano's. Um, Recollection of that dialogue with uh, Dharma Master Hung Lu at the uh, City of Ten Thousand Buddhas. I'd also remembered that, and and how Lumpur Liam has said, "Yeah, it's not really the best way of regarding it because it." Uh, and he, he used a phrase uh, in his comments about it that was uh, said, uh, uh, "The things that we call our obstacles or problems, they actually help us to raise our game." So that you you have to rise up to that, and so if you don't have, and many many times over in that essay he said the same thing that that the, this is how we actually develop skill and and find strengths within ourselves that we didn't know we we have. So I feel that's a sort of tatiyampi. <laughs> that's one of the uh, the most helpful uh, say, teachings or and uh, say. Uh, as a living example of Dhamma, that he, he shows that, or uh, that, that uh, taking the things that we would regard as, oh, if only I didn't have to bother with this, then everything will be great. You know? so, no, just change the angle of approach to that and receive it in a different way, and it becomes a, you know, an interesting puzzle rather than a, a problem that I, uh, I, I'd rather do without. Uh, Lumpur Liam, uh, uh, in the the, um, the bhikkhu ordination process, you have a preceptor. So Lumpur Cha was my preceptor. So the preceptor is the one who sort of proposes a candidate to be accepted by the Sangha. And then in the process of, of the uh, Upasampada, the ordination procedure, then there are two acharyas, two ajans, who do the Pali chanting to, to uh, they carry out the legal act of someone being accepted um, as a bhikkhu in the, the bhikkhu ordination. The Lumpur Liam uh, was one of my chanting acharyas, uh, Ajahn Pabakro, that was, uh, he was the other one. So uh, he literally uh, I was carried into the bhikkhu life <laughs> with Lumpur Liam's uh, assistance. And uh, uh, I lived uh, my early years uh, in Thailand, I was mostly at at Wat Ba Nana Chat, and uh, Lumpur Liam was living over at Wat Ba Pong, so I didn't spend uh, very much time in, in his company. He was the, um, the stores monk at Wat Ba Pong for a long time, so if you wanted uh, a, a new battery for, your, uh, for uh, a, uh, a flashlight, or if you would like some kerosene for your lantern, or if you needed a, a match for your, uh, or a candle, you know, he would... Uh, yeah, so if you, you go and request a box of matches, he would famously give you like three matches. <laughs> okay, that'll last you for a while. Yeah. And uh, so he was um, one who helped to sustain a quality of fewness of needs by his own example and also by being a, a very um, uh, say, um, a, a scrupulous stores monk and, and encouraging people not to be wasteful or indulgent or to, to use the things that we had with, uh, with great appreciation. The, um, 
one of the, the, the stories around that that I might share is um, so when uh, I finished my first rains retreat as a, uh, as a bhikkhu, I was at a, a little branch monastery uh, in, uh, the, in the uh, region of Royette. Royette is, means 101. It's, a, I think, 101 miles from, from Ubon. So it got the, the town of Royette got the name 101. There's a little branch monastery near there where I, I spent my first rains as a, as a bhikkhu. And uh, at the end of that rains retreat, uh, I got a telegram from my family saying my father was very ill. It literally said, Dad, very ill, can you come? And I've been thinking of going back to England uh, to visit uh, anyway. Uh, Ajahn Sumedho had, had um, moved out of London and started up the monastery at Chithurst. And, and uh, when I had left England a couple of years before, I hadn't known uh, uh, that I was going to be becoming a Buddhist monk. So I've been pondering the, uh, and thinking about going back to England anyway. This telegram arrived, so I, I thought, OK, I better... Uh, my, my doubts are settled <laughs> on whether I should or shouldn't go. I need to go quickly. So I scooted down to, to Ubon and uh, went to go and pay respects to, to Lumpur Cha and, and let him know that I'd just got this sort of emergency call to go to England. And he was spending that rains retreat at the little village monastery in, in Bangkok. He'd just been offered that by the, the village uh, committee, village council had, had offered the uh, small village monastery to be a branch of Wabapong. And and Lumpur had spent the, the rains retreat there with, with four Westerners, uh, Ajahn Titignano, Ajahn Gawesako, uh, Samanera De Visaro, and uh, Pakao Sativ, who was Ajahn, who's now Ajahn Kemananda. So. Uh, the four of them were there with Lumpur for the, for the rains. So I went to go and uh, pay respects to, to Lumpur Cha there, and um, Ajahn Jagaro, who uh, was the senior monk at um, Nanachar during that time, it helpfully translated because my Thai was extremely poor. And uh, at that time, my, my arms bowl, I had a, a, a soft steel arms bowl with about uh, four or five uh, holes in it that were patched up with beeswax. And uh, it was um, uh, also an understood that the arms bowls were, were not abundant in the West and that you couldn't fire, that there wasn't the kind of firing uh, process you could, where you could, say, replace the oxide coating on the arms bowl. So the, the word was at that time that you know, if you went to the West, you really needed to have a, a stainless steel bowl. Um, so along with letting Lumpur Cha know, I had this uh, sort of emergency call from my family and that... Um, and that uh, I was requesting permission to go back to, to England. I um, also, uh, I'm never very shy about <laughs> sort of speaking up about things as my, my own character. And I said, oh, by the way, you know, Lumpur, my, my bowl has got four or five holes in it. Yeah, and, uh, and so going to the West, uh, uh, I, you know, I've been um, encouraged to, to, uh, uh, to understand that it would be better if I had a a stainless steel bowl to take with me. And I know these are, are, these are very sort of prized possessions, but uh, this is the advice I've been given. So um, would it be okay to request a, a change of bowl? And, to, if, and if there's a stainless steel one, that would be very helpful. So Lumpur just said, fine. Will, you know, Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> and said, uh, you know, go and ask, uh, go to, go to Wat Bapong and ask uh, uh, Ajahn Liam um, to, to give you a stainless bowl. So this is like you know, walking into a car dealership and saying, "Can I have a Rolls Royce, please?" You know. <laughs> so uh, it's about a mile or about a mile and a half walk from the village monastery to Wapapong. So I duly walked from the village monastery to Wapapong, and uh, Lumpur Liam was there. It was after the Vasa, so there was quite a, lo a long line of of monks uh, queuing up to to speak with him and to make various requests. So I duly waited. My turn came, and uh, and so I then said to, to uh, Ajahn Liam, oh, again, my tie was very poor, but I'm, I, I expressed as well as I could, oh, uh, I'm going to be going to England, and I was just talking with, with uh, Lumpur Cha, and uh, he said it would be okay for me to uh, request a stainless steel bowl, so could you, could you please provide me with one? And he just said, I don't believe you. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, monks, we're not supposed to lie. 
And so, uh, so I was, uh, um, I wasn't quite sure what to make of this. And he just sort of, in, 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 as uh, Lumpur Prasanna was saying, Lumpur Liam's very cool, very kind of non-reactive kind of a person. He just said, you know, I don't believe you. Uh, or words to that effect. You know, that, and so he said, um, go back to, uh, uh, he said, but if you, if you go back to Lumpur and get him to write a note, that he, he does in fact mean you to have a stainless bowl, then, then I'll, I'll think about it. So I walked all the way back to the village monastery, and then Lumpur Chah was still around, and, and paid my respects at Lumpur, um, and Tanajan Liam um, said that uh, he, uh, he won't give me a stainless bowl unless, he, unless he's got a, a written note from you um, to provide, provide me, that he should provide one for me. And Lumpur thought that was hilarious. <laughs> So he duly got a, got a little a bit of uh, a piece of note paper and, and uh, wrote a, a brief note said here, give that to Tan Liam and uh, and uh, see if he gives you one. So I kind of tootled all the way back to to uh, to Wat Ba Pong. So I was getting a lot of exercise that afternoon, and uh, then uh, again waited at the Lumpur Liam's Kuti. <laughs> Had my turn, and gave him the piece of paper, and, and no, no expression on his face whatsoever, and just uh, <laughs> and uh, went into the um, into the the, the kuti the, where the things were stored, and gave me this really nice uh, kind of first class stainless steel bowl. But he said, "You have to keep this until you die or you disrobe." <laughs> so I did keep it for a long, long time, but um, uh, eventually I. I uh, gave it up when I was living here, and um, uh, I adopted the the arms bowl that had belonged to uh, uh, Todd Tansuhat when he was a little Todd when he was a, a novice here for two weeks. And uh, but <coughs> I, even though I didn't quite keep my promise to Lumpur Liam that I would keep it until I died or disrobed, I do keep my my uh, my feelers out for it. I think ex Titapo had it for some time. And I believe it's now in Brazil with yeah. an Abayagiri monk. That's right, Gunaviro. With Venerable Gunaviro. So uh, it's not in my personal possession, <laughs> but I have got the, my uh, trackers on it. So I, I know where in, the, where in the world it is and uh, who happens to own it. So. But that was a very, my first real sort of dialogue with Lumpur Liam was uh, uh, around that, uh, that, that bowl. And, um, and I, I felt uh, it was. Uh, both the, uh, this mixture of him um, sort of not being, um, uh, say, uh, too easily convinced, you know, that he, he, needed, <laughs> he needed proper evidence that uh, something was the case. But when he, he saw that I, I had been telling the truth and Lumpur Chah had in fact said this and this was the, the, this was the case, he then responded with this very, uh, very uh, fine, kind of a, a, a Rolls Royce of an arms bowl. <laughs> it was extremely um, uh, helpful to, to have when I, I went to, to England. <coughs> another, uh, uh, maybe another story to share, particularly representing Lumpur Liam's equanimity, when uh, the early days of uh, Abhayagiri, he was one of the first senior monks we invited to come and stay here. And uh, we only had five kutis at that point. And uh, the, the kind of the, the best one or the most convenient one was the log cabin that's up um, used to be up where the quad quadplex is now, and that where the um, the book storage containers are up on that corner. It was a, a little log cabin, and that was the, the nearest kuti that w was to the uh, uh, in in relationship to this central area. So. Um, when uh, when Lumpur Liam came came to stay, then he was given the you know, that uh, most sort of convenient and best accommodation, and uh, the uh, the log cabin uh, I, I I had uh, lived in it for some time, and uh, the um, the the door had a, a a latch on the outside. So if you were used to living in that kuti, whenever you left the, the kuti, you would turn around, close the latch on the door, and then walk off around, come, to come down to these lower buildings or go about your business around the monastery. And uh, having 
gone to visit Lumpur Liam um, uh, and uh, in the late afternoon or evening, just to sort of make sure everything was okay. Uh, I you know, paid respects, left the kuti, and then closed the latch. There isn't a way of opening the door from the inside. It's a sliding, uh, a sliding, a small sliding bolt. Um, so the door was closed from the outside with no means of opening it from the inside. So the next morning, um, we all sort of gather together at breakfast time. Uh, Lumpur Liam hasn't manifested. Uh, they, oh, uh, well, it's definitely dawn. Day, day has come. Um, maybe he's very tired. And um, so eight o'clock came by, uh, half past eight. Hmm. Nine o'clock, uh, still no sign of Lumpur. We should really go up and take a look. Maybe it was somewhat before nine o'clock. <laughs> it uh, went up the... Um, uh, the the hill to to check and see if Lumpur was all right, and um, he, uh, he was just sitting in the kuti, and uh, we sort of opened the door and said, "You know, Lumpur, are you well?" And he said, uh, "I I, I, well, I didn't have enough time to understand, but I think uh, Lumpur Pasano had the conversation with him, and he said, "Yeah, I tried the door; the door was closed, so I just uh, I just stayed in the kuti, and, uh, and then um, I knew someone would come along at some point." <laughs> And so that was a, 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 I forget the exact conversation, but it was something along those lines. And that, uh, yeah, just, he, he didn't panic or get upset. He just sort of, okay, well, I'm locked in. The door won't open. Okay, well, someone will come along at some point. <laughs> he was just sitting on the, on the bed, meditating, sitting completely uh, undisturbed by the fact that he'd been sort of locked in by a heedless monk. <laughs> and, uh, un uh, totally unflustered and, and uh, kind of had no comment about it whatsoever. Just that, uh, it was just, oh, yeah, that, that's how it is. And, and um, so you know, he, if he needed to relieve, him, relieve himself or get out of the kuti, he couldn't get out. But other people who'd been locked in in different circumstances had either climbed out the window or forced the door open and broken the little lock off. But uh, Lumpur Liam had just, because that same heedless um, procedure had happened a few times. Different, <laughs> different, different guests at different, different occasions. People had employed different tactics of how to, to deal with that. But he just sat there and just, you know, someone will come along, or not. <laughs> you know, life, death, it's all the same, really. Um, so that was very, uh, a very powerful and quiet teaching from, from Lumpur Liam as well. Just, uh, this is the way the world is. I'm shut in a, a room. I can't get out. Okay, sit here. See what happens. The, um, maybe the, the last thing to, to, um, to share, I think Ajahn Yanika pointed out or commented that uh, Lumpur Liam's handwriting is um, very, very beautiful, very tidy, elegant handwriting that he has. It was also quite noticeable when, when he, he was in an informal conversation, he would use a lot of his own idioms. It'd be very, uh, my tie is very poor, but it's really hard to follow <laughs> an informal conversation with, with Lumpur Liam. Um, and he uses a lot of idioms and, and, uh, and he can speak very, very quietly. Um, but when he's giving a Dhamma talk, then his whole manner changes. If he's giving a, a kind of a public teaching, uh, uh, he speaks very precisely. He tends to use much more familiar terms, uh, and uh, there's a, a, a like it's like sort of the spoken version of very neat, <laughs> beautiful handwriting that uh, he uh, he adopts a, a manner that's p perfectly attuned to the time, the place, the situation. So if he's just sort of chatting with people who are more familiar, who know him well then there's a, a particular way of, uh, of speaking and expressing himself and in, in a, uh, a larger format or uh, something that more of a public situation, then the mode changes. And I get the feeling that it, there is no kind of deliberate intention on his part that, OK, I better speak differently because this is a different occasion. But just he naturally moves and adapts to different situations, different circumstances. And that kind of natural adaptability that uh, he, uh, he shows uh, in different situations is, again, I found a wonderful and beautiful example how to, um, you know, to 
uh, to say um, respond and uh, and adapt to, to different circumstances. When he needs to lead, he can step up and and, and lead and speak out and speak very clearly. Be very uh, uh, be very much the head of things. Um, and if he doesn't need to be uh, speaking up or doesn't need to lead, he can disappear. He can literally hide in the middle of a room. You know, he's like, <laughs> is the, he, uh, he doesn't have a kind of uh, dominant presence if he doesn't want to have it. So he just, I remember he, when he came over here, uh, we took him to visit Three Jewels um, Dhamma Hall at, uh, over at Fort Bragg, Mitika's little Dhamma place. And... Um, when he was sitting in the in the the hall there, and um, the, um, somebody took a photograph of the of the, uh, of the hall with him sitting there, and when I saw the photograph, I literally didn't see Lumpur Liam. He's the only person in the photograph, and it wasn't like it was very dark. It was just, you know, I literally there's a photograph of the three jewels down the hall, and oh, there's Lumpur Liam right in the middle of the picture. <laughs> he sort of it could uh, disappear into the space of a room. Uh, in uh, in that way, and so that that kind of um, they, when you need to be someone, you can be someone. When you don't need, when you don't need to be someone, you can be nobody. <laughs> that is very much a, an attribute of his his nature, his uh, his character. And uh, uh, when at uh, at Wat Bapong, it's also I feel very uh, he's a very wonderful example. At the, at the end of the meal time, and people are. Uh, getting up to wash their bowls and go and do things, every single time Lumpur Liam will get up and pick up a broom and, and start sweeping the, the eating hall. Other um, people are sort of going off to do different things and uh, he, he's always taking the trouble just to be keeping the place tidy with, uh, with great humility, great attention and doesn't have anything more uh, important to be doing than the than uh, sweeping up the dhamma hall, to, sweeping up the, the eating hall to, to tidy up after everybody else once the, the, uh, the time for the, the, the communal meal ha- has finished. And that sense of, uh, of taking care of the, 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 um, the tiniest details or tidy, clearing up after other people, <laughs> uh, paying attention to, um, to what's going on. Uh, and... Uh, being ready to lend a hand, do what's needful if something is needed, and being ready to just leave things alone if uh, if there's nothing to be done. Maybe the last story I'll, I'll share was um, again when he was over here, um, and we were we gathered down um, at um, Sumi and Craig's house uh, before flying back uh, to to Thailand, and uh, so there's a group of us staying at the house, and there was this a flurry of monastic. Uh, Activity trying to weigh the baggage, and there was a, the the particular scales that that we had were were not constructed very conveniently for weighing a, weighing suitcases and boxes, and we were trying to you know, balance a box on the corner of the scales and trying to get the accurate weight, and the weight was kind of not uh, it wasn't easy to read it, and and Lumpo Liam was sort of sitting in the uh, the other side of the of the room and not saying it kind of disappearing into the, the space of the room. And you could tell, that, like uh, Lum, uh, Lumpur Pasana was saying, kind of half an eye on, what are those guys doing? <laughs> kind of paying attention, but leaving us to it. And after seeing us sort of flustering around for about 20 minutes, trying to weigh these, these boxes, he, uh, he came over uh, and then um, put the box I think, the, to one side stood on the scales, looked at the number on the scales, picked up the box and saw the difference in numbers between the, <laughs> the, his own weight and, the, and his weight with the box. Put a paint can. Oh, that's right, that's right. That was, put a paint can on the, on the scales and then put the box on top of the paint can, subtracted the weight of the paint can. That was it. After, and the rest of us were... <laughs> ah, that's how you do it. But he didn't say a word, just sort of watched us flustering around, trying to, get, trying to figure it out for 15 or 20 minutes and thought, okay, these guys are not going to get it. <laughs> Came in, offered a very simple solution, produced the, the, the appropriate useful result, and then without a word, it, then they went and, went and sat down. <laughs> 
So those are a few, uh, a few thoughts, a few stories of uh, Lung Po Liam and um, to express our appreciation and his wonderful example and as a, a great and uh, very, uh, much beloved and, and uh, the liberating presence within our community. Anyone? And my own Dhammakataya Sadhu Karam Tadama say Sadhu 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 Ah